So on the road car engines, the fuel rail that sits here, um, it's got a push push lock plastic fitting that connects there. But on the, the GT3 cars, they've got an AN fitting to it. But this will come in handy for nitrous. It would also come in handy for if you wanted to do like a crazy fueling solution and use AN lines. But at the moment, we've not really reached that point yet where we need to be looking at even more fuel because we've got enough fuel for I think around 1600 horsepower, 1600 wheel horsepower of ethanol and then when we run out of that we're going to fit a fuel pump a voltage booster and that will give us around 2100 horsepower of fueling so we don't need to worry about fueling for a while. I'm really excited to strip this because this is a McLaren GT3 racing engine. This is what they use in all the GT3 uh, cars. So McLaren obviously have their road car segment, but they also have their customer racing segment as well. So these engines go into the GT3 cars. I like to learn what the OEM are doing because they're obviously they know a lot more than us. They've got all the R&D. They've got they've got much bigger budgets than any aftermarket or any tuning company. That's what I call them fun coupons. See that? A fun coupon. Right, starting from the top, looking at it externally, it looks more or less the same. Wiring loom is completely different though. Um, all the connectors on the wiring loom are motorsport connectors. On the GT3 racing cars, they use a Bosch motorsport ECU. It is a Bosch, it's a Bosch MS6. So it's got all, all the wiring that is different. All the sensors as well on the engine look completely different. They're like specific to the Bosch ECU, I'm assuming uh, the Bosch Motorsport ECU. More or less otherwise, other than the wiring and the sensors, it looks more or less the same from the outside. No major changes. The intake manifold has obviously got a pack on it. Production GT3 engine, 4 litre, build number one. So that's pretty cool. It's might have been the first one ever built. We're going to begin stripping it now, seeing what changes they made underneath all this hardware. Manifold packing off. Obviously we did the center manifold on the world record car. One thing about the center manifold, it's quite a bit taller than the stock 720S manifold and it's made of carbon fibre. Carbon fibre's pretty cool, but the fact that it's taller, it gives the cylinders a better velocity stack. So the, the air, when you make the runners longer, the air going into the combustion chamber is, it's, it's tumbled, to, it flows a little bit better going into the cylinders. So we did pick up like, 60 to 80 wheel horsepower with the center manifold on that car. So yeah, the GT3 engine is just using a stock 720 manifold. Nothing special about that, uh, which is not a surprise because the center manifold is, uh, it's pricey. Sensor as well, the connectors have been pretty much fused straight onto the map sensor. So that's something totally different to our road car. On the road cars, you just... Nice. Just connect and connect them as you wish. Bosch MS6 ECU specific. One more thing that seems to be missing on this manifold, but it's present on the road cars. They've got EVAP pipes going into this section of the manifold. So the, there's two pipes here that connect to the PCB system, but they've obviously got a different setup on this for crankcase ventilation, which will be interesting to see what they're doing with crankcase ventilation. We haven't really had any crankcase ventilation issues on the McLarens yet. Like on the RS3s for example, when you start running them over three and a half bar, uh, crankcase pressure gets pretty high, so it starts blowing all the oil seals and whatnot out. I was actually made a crankcase breather that allows a drop crankcase pressure to crankcase to breathe properly, so we're going to be testing that soon on one of the 8Ys that we're doing. But yeah, on the McLarens, that two and a half bar, we don't have any crankcase issues so far. But yeah, um, I wonder what they've done on the... Thank you. We are so focused.
connectors on the road cars, it's nothing like this. It's just normal push foot connectors. These are proper motorsport, uh, motorsport spec winding harness. Manifold off, water to oil filler is stock. Looks the same as what they use on the road cars. Thermos, well, usually up here, you've got a thermostat that um, obviously opens and closes depending on how cold and how hot the engine is. On this, there is no thermostat. That just looks like a, but to me, that just looks like no thermostat. It's just straight cooling, which makes sense. On the, on the race cars, you want as much cooling as possible. Even at 500, five, they run them at 500 horsepower. So even at 500 horsepower, it's, you want as much cooling as possible because when you've got a car going around the track, constantly at full power, they get pretty hot. 3.8 liter GT3 cars were, well, from what I know, the, the heads used to overheat and they used to warp. That was the main failure on that engine. On the four liter McLaren engines, what they did was they put additional uh, cooling, cooling holes on the cylinder heads for more cooling. So we'll strip that and I'll show you that as well um, compared to a 3.8 head but that's obviously for cooling. What else have we got here? So this, this is interesting. This looks like, so that's part of the crankcase ventilation system there. And that's a sensor. So it looks like, I'll need to look into it a little bit more, but this is a pressure sensor and that's the crankcase ventilation valve. So what they've done here is they've added a crankcase ventilation or a crankcase pressure sensor even. This is actually pretty cool and I'm gonna see if we can implement it into the road cars because one of the reasons why you would monitor crankcase pressure is crankcase pressure along with coolant pressure, these are two things that when you're having a heavily tuned setup, it would be a good idea to monitor. Crankcase pressure, if anything's failing inside the engine, so say a piston ring is going bad, or crankcase pressure is basically the pressure underneath the piston, so outside of the combustion chamber. So if you're getting an increase of crankcase pressure, it would tell you that something inside the combustion chambers isn't correct. That's why you're getting more crankcase pressure, like a piston ring's failing. That would be one of the reasons, or that would probably be the main reason that, that, that piston ring is failing. So on the race cars, obviously, they probably monitor this because they can't afford to lose a race. So if they're monitoring crankcase pressure and crankcase pressure is increasing at some point from the median, it's probably gonna indicate that the engine is about to fail. So that's really interesting. I'm gonna see if we can transfer that to the road cars. And then again, you've got coolant pressure sensors as well. That's a separate thing. Maybe this has them. I'm gonna look into it a little bit more because there is some sensors that I see on this that are not on the road cars. Coolant pressure you would monitor to see if you're lifting the heads or not. So the coolant obviously sits in water jackets around the engine. If you've been following our McLaren series or when we're, t we're finding new limits on the McLarens, you'll know that we lifted heads at around 12 to 1300 horsepower on the McLarens. So our next development segment on McLarens is upgraded head studs. You monitor coolant pressure because if the heads lift, coolant pressure goes up. So that's the only scenario really, the coolant pressure would go up outside of the normal kind of uh, limits. And that's why when coolant pressure rises, the coolant just comes out of the reservoir cap. So if you were, we were lifting heads on the McLarens and coolant was coming straight out of the reservoir cap, it's obviously an indication that heads are lifting. So we're also gonna look at fitting the coolant pressure sensor on one of our builds so we can monitor the headlines. Sensors, the wiring loom going into them is totally different. Right, another change they've made here, that's an oil pressure sensor. So on the road cars, up here you've got the stock oil pressure sensor, but the thing is on the on the road cars it's it's not a real oil pressure sensor. So engines generally have an oil pressure sensor where on the ECU you can log the oil pressure. So you've got an actual value of what the oil pressure is. On all the 3.8 and the 4 liter McLarens, the oil pressure sensor is a dummy switch. So it's basically, it basically tells the ECU if there is oil pressure or if there isn't oil pressure. A really annoying thing is that you can't monitor the oil pressure on a road car, but obviously they're monitoring the oil pressure using this sensor on the race car. So that's another thing that I'm gonna try and see if we can uh, transfer it to the road cars. Pressure is uh, obviously important within an engine. If like a rod bearing or something is going bad or your torques aren't correct inside the engine, you'll notice that the oil pressure is dropping. Same with if your McLarens are also really funny. They don't have an oil, they do have an oil level sensor, but they don't tell you when the oil level is low. You need to measure it using the, using the, the setting on the dash. 
So if you watch one of our previous videos where we rebuilt one of the McLaren engines in Dubai, that had actually failed due to low oil. The McLarens don't tell you when they're low oil, you have to manually check inside the cluster. So yeah, if you if you're running low on oil pressure, if you're running on low on oil, oil pressure would also drop. So it would have made sense for them to put an oil level sensor or, well, there is an oil level sensor, but for it to actually tell you the oil level, or even it would have been even better if they put an oil pressure sensor into it. So yeah, definitely gonna see if we can retrofit this into the road cars. I don't see it being too difficult, but that would be a really nice input to have. This is the second rear injection blanking. Uh, well, this is a secondary air injection blanking plate. On all of our builds, or well, on all of the road cars, you've got secondary air injection pumps. So what they do is there's two little pumps at the back of, or just under the exhaust, and they blow air into the exhaust system on a cold start. What that does is it adds oxygen into the exhaust system and lowers emissions. It's just another thing that can go wrong. So we remove them. It looks like the GT3 cars have got them factory fitted, so. Another thing that the GT3 teams are doing. Again, you need to keep in mind that the GT3 teams don't care about emissions, which makes sense, why would they? Stock head studs are a 10.9 grade bolt. At 1150 to 1200 horsepower, we were lifting heads on the McLarens. Right, so this is a head stud. It's an L19 ARP head stud. You're probably wondering why we're not using ARP 2000 or ARP 625, which are quite popular. The reason why we're using L19 and not ARP 65 or ARP 2000, ARP 2000 isn't as strong as ARP 65. ARP 65 and L19 are around about the same strength, but with ARP 625, you need to talk them down a lot harder than the L19 ones. So the L19s get talked down to around 80 to 85 foot pounds, whereas uh, the ARP 625s will be another 20 foot pounds on top of that. Now, because this is an aluminium block, one thing you need to watch out for when you're upgrading head studs is you need to watch out for warping the block. So if you're applying a lot of torque with something like an ARP 625, the block can warp or the cylinder head can even crack. So that's why we chose ARP L19 head studs because at the end of the day it is an aluminium block and you need to take into consideration the amount of torque that you're going to be applying onto the cylinder head and the block itself to avoid it distorting. Now what these do better than the stock 10.9 grade bolts is they're tensile, they're a lot more tensile than the stock ones. So the stock ones will stretch and then they'll move back into place. So that's when the head lifts. When the head lifts, all the combustion gases go into the cooling chamber and all that. But with the L19 ones, they're a lot more tensile, so they'll be a lot more resistant to stretching. And hopefully we'll be able to make, I mean, we're hoping these will be good to around 1600 to 1800 mil horsepower, maybe even more. But yeah, there are, there's some other limits that we need to overcome before we go past 1600 to 1800 mil horsepower. One of the main ones is turbos. We don't have turbos big enough yet that can make 1600 to 1800. Another one is traction. So with M Engineering, we've been working a lot on the traction control program. Got it pretty much nailed. So at around 11 to 1200, these things grip. As we move up in power, we're going to need better uh, traction control strategies. So that's another thing that we need to keep in mind as we move up in power on these engines. Obviously I've mentioned that the coolant pump has got a blank on it, it doesn't connect to the aircon pump because they don't run aircon pumps on these cars. Oil pump has also got a blank on it for the alternator. The pistons, liners and crank, they all look to be the same as what they use in the old car so I don't imagine there's going to be any changes. Stripping the shop block, but 
I think we'll pretty much end the video there. We are going to, this is actually going to be going into a road car. So we're going to be building it back up. And yeah, stay tuned for our next video when we discuss the upgrades that are going into the road record car.